There's a king, his name's Belshazzar. And I'm not gonna read it to you, but I'm just gonna tell you the story real quick because it's a, it's a beautiful picture of this right side up kingdom and the way that it works. So Belshazzar, he's king. He's in a, he's in a very, very wealthy area. He's, he's in his castle, right? And um, Babylon and uh, there's an army that's coming against him. The Medo Persian army is coming against him to conquer him. They eventually do, but they're coming to conquer him. And instead of running out or trying to negotiate, instead, Belshazzar, the, the way the story goes, he throws a party. He throws a party because he is overconfident in his exterior walls and the army that is fighting the Medo Persians, his army fighting the Medo Persians for him. His walls are 22 inches thick. I could see some confidence from that. But he's overconfident. He assumed he was fine. So he throws a party with a thousand of his lords. It's a drunken party. It's a buffet, if you will. And in the midst of this drunken party, he brings in, and this is an important detail, his wives and his concubines. If you know anything about that kind of ancient culture, you didn't bring the wives and the concubines to the same party, right? That's not the way you do that. So he's an example because it's funny how as we're going along, enjoying the status that we have, we can become self-absorbed. We can become so self-absorbed that we are destructive to other people. We can throw a party while soldiers are outside the walls risking their lives. We can waste food while people starve. We can abuse people, i.e. his wives that care for us. We can find ourselves doing terrible things in the cloud of status, power, privilege, and perks. And so in that very same moment, while they're having the party, the text says that a hand appears writing on the wall. And the hand supernaturally writes these two words, mene and tekel, and I'm probably pronouncing those wrong. But mene means God has numbered your kingdom, Belshazzar, and finished it. Tekel means you have been weighed in the balances and you have been found wanting the handwriting on the wall. And then he was defeated. The message for us today is that the right side up kingdom, its days are numbered. Amen. And if we are a part of the right side up kingdom, our days are numbered. Amen. That's a hard statement. But we need to know that. Jesus had better. Jesus came to bring his upside down kingdom. So now let's get to the good news. Jesus, I, I, I kind of see him like a new sheriff coming to town. And when a new sheriff comes to town, new sheriff brings his new plan when he comes to town, yes? So Jesus is going to come to earth and he's gonna bring his brand new plan for his brand new kingdom. But the way he's going to bring it is he's going to walk it out by example first. Before there's an upside down kingdom, he lives an upside down life. And Philippians chapter two describes this upside down life of Jesus to us. Powerful words. He says, you must have the same attitude that Christ Jesus had. Though he was God, he did not think of equality with God as something to cling to. Look at Jesus giving up his status. Instead, he gave up his divine privileges. He took the humble position of a slave and was born as a human being. And when he appeared in human form, he humbled himself in obedience to God and he died a criminal's death on the cross. Therefore, God elevated him to the place of highest honor and gave him the name above all other names. <clears throat> Jesus humbled himself and he gave up, he let go of self-focus. Some of your translations say he emptied himself of all his rights and privileges. He took the role of a servant or slave. See, that role of a servant doesn't even make sense to us in our culture much anymore. But in that culture, it was the person who did all the dirty work for you and they had to do it. And Jesus took that kind of a role. And we're gonna dive into that and see what that means. But he, he did it because he loved people. He served people. 
and he obeyed God the Father. And that service and that obedience led him to death on the cross is what that says. Now, why would that, why would loving people, why would that, that eventually lead him going down that road to death on a cross? Because the rescue of humanity required it. It was the only way that our sins could be paid for, yours and mine. Jesus had to die. In short, he loved us. Let's look at some other ways that Jesus walked as a servant throughout his life. So this is kind of topical. I'm showing you a lot of different verses here, but I want you to see the themes that were running through the gospel so that you can know the life of Jesus. Jesus was a servant and he lived an upside down life. The first part you see that is in Luke chapter two, verse 51. It's one of the first references to the things that Jesus did. He's 12 years old. And when he's 12 years old, some of you guys know the story. He got lost in the temple. His parents were on this trip to Jerusalem. He got lost in the temple, but he didn't really get lost. That phrase lost in the temple, it's used by his parents because they couldn't find him. He was actually, he said, where he was supposed to be talking to people about the father, doing the father's work. But mom and dad got nervous, yes? Mom and dad got nervous. And, and in, in Jewish culture, being 12 years older, you're right on the cusp of adulthood. And Jesus enters into the ministry. And can I just say before we go any further that Jesus was more intelligent than his mom and dad. He was more spiritually mature. He was more powerful. By any measure, Jesus had it on Mary and Joseph by 12 years old. But what the scripture says in Luke chapter 2, verse 51, is that when Jesus returned home from Jerusalem, from the temple, back with them, it says that he became subject to his mom and dad. See, he emptied himself of his rights and he became subject to mere human parents. Some of you are struggle to be subject to your parents, yes? <clears throat> Matthew chapter 3, verse 13 is the baptism of Jesus by John. Jesus allows John to baptize him. Now, that's a big deal because John's a sinner and Jesus isn't. And baptism represents cleansing from sin. But the father had told Jesus to do it. So he comes to John the Baptist and John's first words, if you know the text, are, I shouldn't baptize you, you should baptize me. And Jesus doesn't correct him, which is a funny little moment in between the lines. He just says, let us do it now because this will fulfill all righteousness. So Jesus empties himself of status again and allows this sin sinful man to baptize him. John chapter four, verse 34. Jesus says that he does only the father's will and not his own. So he says all the plans of his ministry, he even says all the words that I say are words that the father gives to me. Jesus says all the words come from God. There's like a, there's like a channel that comes straight from God the Father, and those are the words that I speak. So the teaching that Jesus did, the actions that Jesus took, who he healed and who he didn't heal, he said that all came from God the Father. Do you hear the humility in that? He's not taking credit. And he's yielded and he's submitted to somebody else. All through the Gospels, you have Jesus healing people. You have him teaching people. You have him feeding people who are hungry. You have him rescuing people and he's doing all these things to the point of exhaustion. Do you see how Jesus is a servant? John 13, he washed the feet of his disciples. We're gonna talk about that text later on. John chapter 21, verse nine, Jesus cooked breakfast for the disciples. It's this scene after the resurrection and they're all out fishing on the lake and they come back to the shore and Jesus is already there with a wood fire going. He's already cooked bread and already cooked fish. And he's like, why don't you sit down and eat? This is the king of kings. Just made them breakfast. Shouldn't they be waiting on him? Jesus lived the life uh, of a servant. So here's where he taught this. This is the Sermon on the Mount. Um, Luke chapter six, verse 20. This is Jesus sitting down and teaching his disciples. This is the upside down kingdom life. He's telling them how to do it. 
Verse 20, then Jesus turned to his disciples and said, God blesses you who are poor for the kingdom of God is yours. God blesses you who are hungry now for you will be satisfied. God blesses you who weep now for in due time you will laugh. And I just want to explain that one really quick, that, that weep and laughter. Uh, the laughter is a word that, that means you're celebrating a victory or a success. So the person who is weeping has lost. They're in a time, they're in a season where they tried something and it failed or where they had something, could even been a relationship and they've lost that thing. And they're in a place of loss. For in due time, you will laugh. So let's look at these words. To be poor is to have less or even much less than other people have, correct? Hungry, it's when your appetites are not satisfied. How many appetites do you have? How many things do you want? You got an appetite for food. You got an appetite for sleep. You got an appetite for fame, yes? You got an appetite for sex, yes? These are uncomfortable to talk about in church, but you got appetites, yes? What happens when your appetite is not satisfied? You are hungry. Jesus says, it's a, best, it's a blessed place to be, to be hungry in any of those areas. We did 21 days of prayer and fasting in January, and some of you were very hungry. Jesus says, that's a blessed place to be. See, we get, there, there, there's a reason there's blessing. The first reason I'll give you is that when we're in any of those three places, we're, we're poor or we're hungry or we're weeping, we are getting free from the right side up kingdom one inch at a time. Because when you don't have, that thing starts to lose its grip on you. Yes? When, when you don't have, when, when, when you don't have money, money loses its grip. When you don't have food, food starts to lose its grip. That's one of the reasons that we fast. When you experience hurt and loss, sometimes that's the first time that you ever clinged on to God for the first time. And if you had not gone through that hurt and loss, you never would have done it. You actually became stronger in those moments and more Christ-like in those moments. Some of you, if I had sat down and interviewed you all individually, which I'm not gonna do, but if I did, and you told me about the times that you were closest to God in your life, you would probably start recounting to me times that you had gone through crisis, times that you had gone through difficulty, those were the seasons that caused you to look up and to finally see him. It's usually not when we're satisfied that we go looking for God. Isn't that the human condition? It's the way we've been taught, guys. And it's our nature. So Jesus says like, hey, I'm gonna turn this thing upside down. Blessed are you if you're poor. Blessed are you if you're hungry. Blessed are you if you're weeping. Because something starts to happen in you. So in the upside down kingdom, Jesus does not promise power, privilege, or perks. Have you gotten that yet? <laughs> in fact, in the upside down kingdom, you will likely lose power, privilege, and perks Amen. in order to obey God the Father and in order to love people. That will be the way of it. There's a family that Linda and I knew um, in Illinois, Ken and Joanne Ryder. And we were in our 20s and going to this church and Ken is this super accomplished accountant in his industry and um, very respect respectful guy. He's an elder in the church. They've got six kids at home, big family, a lot of responsibilities. All of a sudden, Ken shows up on a Sunday and said, God called my family to move to South America to be missionaries because some missionary person had called him up and said that they needed an accountant down there. And so he said that basically over the next year, every member of my family, we're all gonna be learning Portuguese for the very first time. I'm gonna give up my job and we're all gonna move down there in order to do this ministry. Amazing, amazing. How do you come to that place? You only come to that place when you see a savior who gave up all of his status in order to love people. 
And then you look at that and say, that wasn't just for Jesus. That's for me. Amen. That's the way that I want to live. It's part of what's hard about preaching this kind of thing is that many of us, whether we think about it or not, we come to Jesus in order to get something. Like you came today to Jesus to get something. So to hear that his word is saying that to come to Jesus is to lose a whole lot of things. That's a tough message, yes? That's hard. And I know some of you are going to be running right up and saying, but if you lose, you're going to gain everything. Amen. And you're absolutely right. But don't skip to the second step. Because when you're in the middle of it, it feels like you're losing. And you've got to allow that step. Because that's where all the treasure is, guys. Verse 20 or 22. What blessings await you when people hate you, exclude you and mock you and curse you as evil? Because you follow the son of man. When that happens, be happy, he says. Yes, leap for joy. For a great reward awaits you in heaven. And remember their ancestors treated the ancient prophets the same way. Now, when I got to this passage, I couldn't help thinking about Stephen. Were you guys here for the Stephen week? We looked at this man who was in this moment where he could have defended himself and he could have escaped, but instead he saw it as a moment to preach the gospel to some hostile people. And he did. And he knew God was telling him to. And Stephen, this young man, the very first martyr of Christianity, he made the decision to love people and obey God the Father and it got him killed. And there's this moment, and I, I hope you can see it this way. But there's this moment where he's got the court of human opinion right in front of him. And they're angry. And he's lost everything with them. And he's got a second court that suddenly opens up in heaven. And it's God's court. It's the throne of God the Father. And if you remember from last week, Jesus stands up and looks down at him in honor. That's my son. Amen. And so you got to imagine what Stephen's doing there. He's getting killed by the court of human, human opinion, but he's got the affirmation of God's court. Hallelujah. What a picture of our lives, everybody. This, this is so often what we will have to give up. And this is what Jesus is talking about here. There's going to be moments people aren't going to like you. <laughs> There's going to be moments if you stand up for God or you speak the truth about God, people will actually mock you and even hate you. And in those moments, he says, leap for joy. Whew. How in the world do you leap for joy and be happy in a moment like that? Well, first off, I don't think he means that you're joyful about the pain. Can I just kind of explain this just a little bit? I don't think you're joyful about the pain. I think that's weird, yes? I don't think you go running after pain. I don't think you go running after poverty or running after hunger or any of those things. I don't think you run after it. But I think that when life brings it to you, you see the treasure in it. When life brings it to you, you don't run from it. You allow it to happen. Yes. And you see the treasure that's there. It's hard to do. What, what treasure did Stephen have? In the midst of everything Stephen was going through, he knew the treasure that these people were going to know the gospel from then on out. And of course, Paul eventually is going to convert and that whole story is going to happen. That's Stephen seeing the treasure in the midst of difficult circumstances. Ken and Joanne Ryder, who went to South America, they're giving up all of this stuff, but they're seeing the treasure in the midst of it. They're going to help out missionaries who are going to preach the gospel and they're going to make a kingdom impact in this world. And it's going to matter and it's going to be eternal and that makes it worth it. Amen. Treasure in the trial. Here's one more treasure. You ever notice how when you're in the midst of those difficult moments, it draws you closer to God. It brings you to him. It also loosens our grip on all of that stuff. There's just so much good stuff. All right, you might remember Jesus had 12 disciples. These are the 12 disciples that are listening to him preach the Sermon on the Mount. 
And so you would think Jesus has just preached this sermon. They should get the upside down kingdom now. They should get how this works. They should be willing and maybe even wanting to give up status in order to follow God and love people, but they don't. I've got a slide for you here. The disciples arguing about who's the greatest. If you've read the gospels before, you know this theme. Even though Jesus is out there preaching the kingdom of God, the upside down kingdom, they are still operating as if it's the right side up kingdom. So you got 12 disciples walking around wondering which of them is ultimately going to be in charge. Because you don't just give up status seeking so easily, do we? So they argue about it in, at least in those five different times. It's a huge problem for them. And by the way, um, you might know this sneaky little thing that the Bible does. Usually it puts, us, puts a character in the Bible for us to laugh at a little bit until you realize you're them. So they're the stand-in for us, right? Because we also love Jesus, but we're still kind of stuck in this right side up kingdom. So look at what he says. This is one of the arguments. Um, Matthew 18, verse one. About that time, the disciples came to Jesus and they asked, who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? Now, what are they really asking? They're saying, Jesus, of us 12 men, which one of us is the greatest? I love this. Jesus called a little child to him and put a child among them. This kid is greater than all of you. <laughs> Egos. Then he said, I tell you the truth, unless you turn from your sins and become like little children, you will never get into the kingdom of heaven. So anyone who becomes as humble as this little child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Wait, this uneducated, immature, inexperienced child is more humble and better than we are? Yes. Why? Because they're innocent and they have not yet gotten addicted to this right side up kingdom yet. Amen. They're not addicted to status like you guys are. Your age on this point is actually working against you. You've got a lot of unlearning to do. Yeah, so Jesus says, humble yourself. Let your ego go. The, the disciples have become self-obsessed. Again, just like Belshazzar, just like a lot of us, and humility is greatness in the kingdom of God. There was a time when our kids were young, and Linda and I have told this story before. Um, we did a parenting message a couple years ago, and she told this story to all of you. But I'll repeat it here. Um, there was a day where she was with our little ones, and it had gotten overwhelming for her as a mom and just all the things and some temper came up and some words got said that she regretted. And once everything calmed down, she gathered the three of them together and she owned what she had done to them and asked them their forgiveness of her. I heard about it all that night at the dinner table. And she did that several times. And I'll even be honest, there were times in there, especially the first few times that she did that, that a couple of the kids misunderstood the moment and kind of got this cockiness about like they had something to hold over mom. And I did not choke them to death, I promise you. <laughs> They're all still alive, thank God. But it took them a while to understand what she had done. Because what had she done? She had taken her parental status and she had set it down to do what was right and to love her kids. Why? Because some lessons cannot be told to your kids. Some of them have to be shown. Amen. And Linda Shrewblood showed it. Amazing lady. Luke twenty two twenty four. 24. Here's another one where they're arguing. Then they began to argue among themselves about who would be the greatest among them. And Jesus told, this, told them, in this world, the kings and great men lord it over their people, yet they are called the friends of the people. But among you, it will be different. Those who are the greatest among you should take the lowest rank. And the leader should be like a servant. 
Who is more important, the one who sits at the table or the one who serves? It's the one who sits at the table, of course, but not here in the kingdom of God. For I am among you as one who serves. So Jesus gives them a little illustration and it's so helpful. He's like, have you ever gone to a fancy restaurant and you had a beautiful steak dinner? Because of course it's steak, amen? It's gotta be steak. So you have this great steak dinner and you can afford this dinner and you sit down to eat the steak dinner. You have a waiter come, servant come in order to serve you. He says, who is more important in the social structure? Well, they probably can't afford that steak dinner. That's why they're working here. That's not always the case, of course, but often it is. And often what we do in our imagination is we put them in a lower position to ourselves and we treat them like that. And we've all got our little subtle ways of treating them like that. Treating them lower than us. I'm gonna watch your service. I'm gonna watch you do what you do. Do you do enough for me? Do I feel it? Right? Do you, do you hear the power in that? Because that's what we're doing is we're exercising power in that moment. So Jesus says, we all understand that in the way that that works. He says, in the kingdom of God, it's upside down. If you're at a church potluck, you don't sit down with your food. You're the one who serves at the church potluck. That's what Jesus just told them. He says, you may be higher rank in this world, but you take a lower rank and you act like a servant. Amen. There was a time um, I was in another church and they had two different church campuses. Um, the second campus was about 20 minutes away from the first campus. And here's what I would do as a preacher there. I would have to, there was a team of us. Um, I would have to um, preach at the early service at campus number one. And then there would be um, a car and they would drive us to the second campus 20 minutes away. You'd preach again. And after that sermon was done, you'd hop back in the car and they'd drive you back to the original campus and you'd preach a third time for the late service there. And it was fine. But there was this guy, his name's Kirk Bodie. And I've talked about him here before. Kirk Bodie is just this amazing rock star of a person. When Linda and I were first looking for churches, Kirk Bodie was one of the top three reasons we chose that church because he was such a man of God. He was a lawyer. He made a lot of money, did a lot of pro bono work, was super respected in the community. And in that church, he was an elder. He would get up and preach every once in a while because he was taking seminary classes on the side because that's how much he loved God's word. And he was just a humble man. And he also ran our preaching team meeting for us. So on Tuesday mornings, we would go to plan the next service and we'd talk about what happened the last Sunday. And Kirk is the one who would keep us on the straight and narrow and help us study God's word deeper. And Kirk just was a man of God. I thought the world of Kirk. So when it came time for us to talk about this little driving plan, and how this was going to have to work, guess who pulled up in the car? Kirk did. He's like, I'm going to drive you to the next campus and drive you back. He had taken his car and had it washed and vacuumed and cleaned, and he did everything he could to make that experience wonderful. Why in the world did he do that? I think it's because Kirk had been doing stuff like that all his life in little ways. And this just made sense to him to do again. Do you see the spiritual status that a man like that had in my life? The financial status that a man like that had in my life, even the organizational status that he had in, in that church, he had everything over me and he decided to be my driver. It's, it's just the way people are when they take Jesus seriously. When they read these passages seriously and they're like, he humbled himself for me. I better humble myself for other people. I've got some things. I better give them away for all the right reasons. Man of God. Um, so the thing that we just read previously about the waiter 
that was at the Last Supper, right before Jesus went to the cross. And after Jesus had had that conversation with them, and even at the Last Supper, they had been arguing about who was the greatest. Once the conversation was done, it says that Jesus got up from the table and he took off his outer robe. And some of you guys know this story. And he got a basin of water and he got a towel and he went around and he washed the disciples' feet. Because again, at some point you stop telling people what it is and you start showing them what it is. And so he washes the disciples' feet, all 12 of them. It's, it's mind-blowing. And 2,000 years of church history, it doesn't almost feel mind-blowing to us, but I can guarantee you it was because their feet smelled. It was not a formal ceremony. This is what slaves did when wealthy people came over to the house. You washed their feet because their feet were dirty and smelly. You washed them. And Jesus did that for these 12 disciples. Now, this would have been very meaningful, uh, very shocking, and a bit mind-blowing for them. Why? Because he's the king of kings, and they know it. Like, they've seen this guy raise the dead, Lazarus. They've seen this guy walk on water. They've seen this guy heal, do all kinds of miracles. Like, he talked to the weather, and the weather changed. These guys saw that. And it's that guy that comes to wash their feet. You want to talk about uncomfortable. This was not a nice little ceremony. Verse 12, when he had finished washing their feet, Jesus put on clothes, his clothes, and he returned to his place. Do you understand what I have done for you? He asked them. And the real answer, if they had answered it, would have been no. We have no idea what you just did. You call me teacher and Lord, and rightly so, for that is what I am. Now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also should wash one another's feet. I have set you an example that you should do as I have done for you. So it's like he's with the 12. He's about to go to the cross. He's about to die in the dark for us. And he's like, they cannot miss this lesson. And he takes all their excuses away. But Jesus, I'm too intelligent to do that kind of work. I'm too important in this community to do that kind of work. I don't have time. All the excuses melt away when all of a sudden the king of kings does it. Jesus trumps us all. Do you realize he trumps us all? Why don't you guys stand up? Jesus did not come to be easy. He came to turn this world upside down. Jesus did not come to give us comfortable circumstances. Jesus came to change us. Let's pray. Lord, there's a call to surrender in all this. And Lord, I pray, God, that our answer would be yes. Lord, I pray that we would give up status. We would see ourselves giving up our status for the love of other people, for the obedience of God. Jesus, call us to that place. We love you. In Christ's name, amen.